please make sure you're reading um, John and his books and following him. But I want us today to, to learn from his experience. And uh, so, John, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so grateful for you taking the time. It's, it's a very great pleasure to be with you. Um, it's lovely looking at the faces. I, I recognize more of you than I thought I would. And uh, I feel a bit redundant because I, I think that you could gain as much from the collected wisdom that's looking at me now than from me. But it's a real honor to be with you. I'd just like to mention something that may be of interest to all of you. My film has just come out. It's called Against the Tide. And it's a two part film, filmed a documentary in Oxford and in Israel. And it's really about God and science and Christianity and the evidence base for it. And it will very soon, I hope, be available on Amazon. But if you Google it against the tide, there's a Hollywood actor is my dialogue partner. And it was a very interesting thing to do. And I hope it will be very useful mm -hmm. in the context of communication and be used in teaching and so on. But that's by the way, that's not what I'm here for today. Well, that's excellent though, because we're all, we're all looking for good resources, um, good resources. Well, what we'll focus on is lessons that you've learned uh, throughout your life as a Christian academic. So let me just start with a, a, a very central issue today, and that is the pressure on, on believers. Would you tell us about a time when you, when you were pressured as a follower of Christ in the academy to relent or recant and how you responded to that pressure? Well, certainly, I think in one sense, I was very blessed in that I had a, a very extreme example of this when I was young. In fact, I was 19 and I just started Cambridge and I was sitting at a dinner with a Nobel Prize winner and I'd never met one before. And as I normally do with anyone new, I try to ask them questions because I'm interested in people, as you said. And I talked to him about his work and asked him if anything that he had discovered for which he'd won the Nobel Prize ever gave him the impression that there was a mind behind the universe. And he became very angry and didn't like the question. So I just let it drop. And I thought that was the finish. He turned and spoke to his companion on the other side. But after the meal, he said, Lennox, come to my room. And I could tell by the tone, this was not a, an invitation. It was a command. And I went to his room and to my amazement, he'd invited several other senior members of the university. And so far as I recall, because it's a very long time ago, it's 56 years ago or so, they sat me down and he said, now, he said, do you want to have a career in science? And I said, yes. Well, he said, if you do, you must give up this naive faith in God because it will cripple you intellectually. You will suffer by comparison with your peers and you'll never make it. So I'm going to invite you in front of witnesses to renounce your faith in God here. It was absolutely astonishing. I'd never met pressure like it. And of course, it occurred to me afterwards that if he'd been a Christian and I'd been an atheist, he would probably have lost his job the next day. But such is the imbalance at that level. And I believe the Lord helped me because I was devastated by this. And I managed to say to him, sir, tell me, what have you got to offer me that's better than what I've already got. And he said, well, he said, the philosophy of Emile Bergson. Now, I was staggered because 
I happen to know, even at the age of 19, something about the philosophy of Emile Bergson, simply because I'd read C.S. Lewis. And it was amusing later to discover that Emile Bergson was a very poor choice of somebody's philosophy to take me away from Christianity because Bergson admitted in later life that he would have converted to Christianity had circumstances been different. So I stood up and I said, well, if that's all you've got to offer, I'll take the risk, I'll stick with what I've got. Well, that was a, a completely foundational experience for me. It did several things. First of all, it put steel into my heart, but secondly, it made me resolve never to adopt this kind of tactic. And if ever I got to be in the kind of position I now am in, I'm never going to use that kind of methodology. I will present evidence and trust people to make up their own mind. So it was very important to me, but that, that was in early days. In, in later life, Daryl, possibly because I'm a pure mathematician, I haven't encountered a great deal of opposition except for subtle hints from leading academics, I must say, saying that if I am not careful in the way I ask questions, particularly about naturalism and biology and various aspects of evolution, then I would be rejected by the academy. But that, that it never happened. I mean, I've sensed hostility, massive hostility uh, from people like Richard Dawkins in particular. He's the supreme example of antipathy from a scientist. And he, of course, at one stage was giving lectures, essentially mocking what I believed and so on. But with the years, I, I think the Lord has given me the strength to combat that. Uh, as someone well said, if you don't like the heat, stay out of the kitchen. And when you get involved in debating some of these people. But I think that was the seminal thing. Of course, as a student, I got riled by other students and laughed at and all this kind of thing. But it wasn't all that serious because usually I found I could <laughs> give uh, as good as I got. Okay, very good. Now, in light of that, um, what would be your counsel to young academics who are facing increasing hostility, even as one scholar called it, Christophobia? Uh, how open should Christian academics be about their allegiance to Christ when, when they're starting now in 2021? Well, the difficulty here is that's a generic question. Christian academics are individuals. They're in very different disciplines. They're in very different situations. And the answer to that question depends entirely on those two things, who they are and what they're doing and, and where they are. And even to a certain extent, what country they're in, what is the dominant philosophy of that country? So there are no generic answers to such questions that I know of. But ha having said that, I think what is very important is that we should, as we're starting off, concentrate on witnessing to our peers. And I use the word witness rather than giving lectures. I think that one of the keys to all of this, to being able to mature without too much aggression and too much negativity, is to learn to ask thoughtful questions and to know when to stop. Now, because your question is so important, I've actually, you may not all know this, written a very short book on this called Have No Fear. And it's geared to people in that kind of situation. Have no fear. I don't know how many languages it's in, but it's probably the cheapest book you'll ever buy. But it concerns me because the fear and shame through peer pressure often shuts people up. And one image I have in mind mm -hmm. is of a, a very senior full professor in a leading world-class university 
who when I'd never met him before, I was just chatting to him as fellow Christians and he started to weep. And I was embarrassed. I said, what's the matter? He said, my colleagues have brought me to silence. I can't say anything anymore. Now, of course, I didn't know his circumstances, but I never forgot that. Mm. These pressures are deep and they're very real and they're part of a battle. And I believe the battle is against naturalism. Uh, and that's why it's so good to see people like Ralph Bergman here and uh, who really are combating this, uh, the sort of generation below me, if Ralph will allow me to say that. It's, it's hugely important. But I would say that we mature. And if we learn to try to befriend people first and to get to know them by asking them questions, then there'd be less threat in the context of when they start asking us questions about what motivates us and what's important for us. I, I think that attitude friendship, Socrates is a great hero to me in his asking questions. And obviously, it's easier to witness, and by witness I mean that you're answering questions people are asking. I've often found Peter's statement that we all know and we all quote has got a hidden principle in it that doesn't always, we don't always notice it, but he says always be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you a reason concerning the hope that is within you. That's not a lecture, that's conversation. And the question comes from the other person. It's not even you making a statement, it's the other person asking you. And therefore, I think my task principally as a Christian academia is to create an environment where people want to ask questions. And I remember my mentor years ago saying, if you want people to find you interesting, you need to be interested. In other words, gaining credibility in your own field and certainly not being a monomaniac. In other words, somebody who can only talk about one subject apart from their academic discipline. I think they're all sorts of practical points that we can learn and teach younger people to help them break through the very real fear barrier and indeed shame barrier. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's that's very helpful. What is it? We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. And one thing salt does is makes us thirsty. So we're supposed to make other people thirsty for Jesus, aren't we? That's right. And we're to be wise as serpents and harmless yeah. as doves. Yeah. I think one of the keys here, Daryl, is where Peter in 1 Peter says, that we are to witness with respect. I think we've got to both show respect to others, but also gain respect. Mm -hmm. We need to be folks that attract respect. And if the only thing we can talk about is God, we certainly will not do that. No. We got to be interested in things that our academic colleagues are interested in, their sport, their politics, if we're geared to that, their intellectual pursuits. I just find people love being asked questions about what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And unless they're complete bores, they will in the end ask you a question and, and then you can give a judicious answer. But don't say everything at once. Change the topic before they do and, and so on. I remember the, the last time we were visiting in your office there in Oxford, you had just that the night before maybe or two nights before debated a leading atheist down in Southampton. I can't even remember the name of the atheist. Peter Atkins. Peter Atkins, of course. Well, I would be interested. You've debated several of the leading atheists, uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Peter Singer, uh, Atkins. Would you tell us a story or two that comes <laughs> out of those debates? Because uh, to me, that's you're you're fleshing out the principles that you're talking to us about. Oh, very, very much so. 
And the more hostile people are, the more I try to befriend them, which sometimes irritates them. But it's, it's quite remarkable what can happen. I, I was on a, a Q&A show, which is very famous in Australia, vast numbers of people watching. And I was invited on it and told that they would rip me to pieces because very few evangelical Christians like me would be invited on. And it's tough politicians and i was shown one or two clips from previous shows and i was absolutely terrified and <laughs> when i went into this uh show it, it was a very motley crew because there was a a comedian on it who was very foolish and the 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 moderator of the whole show who wasn't the usual moderator she gave him far too much time and he talked nonsense and people were constantly phoning in to get her to shut him up but then there was a sociologist and there was a i think a pentecostal expert on on something there was one other at least one other christian but there was a very well known um i think she was a, a social scientist of some kind and she was very antipathetic to me but <laughs> During this thing, I wondered what is going to happen. And she made a statement and I jumped in and backed her up. And she was utterly astonished. Absolutely. It, it was visible. And all Australia watched this astonishment that I would agree with her, you see. And she said something and then suddenly she stopped. And then she said, you know, looking at me, she said, I read one of Dawkins' books recently. They're rubbish, aren't they? <laughs> and it gave me a unique opportunity. And I was telephoned by a very well-known Australian Christian. He said, I couldn't believe what I saw last night on that show. Never has anything like that happened. And instead of them tearing me to pieces, I, I felt I got quite a good opportunity in this. So that kind of thing happens. and. I think the funniest thing was Peter Singer, though. Uh, they wanted to do a debate, uh, organize a debate between me and Singer. And I thought, goodness, I had the advantage of doing a, an MA in bioethics, which helped me because I'd read some of his stuff and analyzed it and written a thesis on it, comparing his naturalism in ethics with Dawkins' naturalism in science. But anyway, it was still pretty formidable. And it was in Melbourne Town Hall. I shall never forget it because very often I'm either asked by the moderator or I tell people, you know, my background is Christian. I come from Northern Ireland, which is not always an advantage in people's minds because of its sectarianism. And I tell something about my parents and the way in which they weren't sectarian and allowed me to think, which was enormously important, et cetera, et cetera. So when I'd finished and Peter came to the first segment, he said, well, there you are. He said, we've just seen a demonstration of my main objection to religion. People remain in the faith in which they were brought up. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. So I waited a little having done my homework. And I said, Peter, you know, I told them about my parents and you've made a, a comment. So can I ask you please about your parents? Were they atheists? Oh, he said, yes. Oh, he said, ha, you've remained in the faith in which you were brought up. Oh, but he said, it isn't a faith. And I said, Peter, really, I'm so sorry. I thought you believed it. And of course the whole place erupted <laughs> and I learned later that in cyberspace at the time, there were dozens of people writing in and saying, here's one of the world's most famous philosophers. And he doesn't realize that his worldview is a belief system. And it's issues like that that come up again and again and again. I've had them out with Dawkins and, and Hitchens as well. That is part of the battle. And you learn a great deal from that, that these people really believe that they don't have beliefs, which is unbelievable. <laughs> so, yes, I, I, I suspect I've learned a great deal from these things. Of course, you realize that 
you don't always get it right. You make mistakes. Uh, one of the mistakes I remember going on the other side was, and it's such a pity this, I did a debate with Richard Dawkins in the Oxford Natural History Museum. And as I walked in for the debate, I recalled that the building had been built to honor the glory of God in creation, but I couldn't place the exact reference. So I went up to the desk, there were only minutes to go. And Dawkins was there looking very hostile. And they knew nothing about this, absolutely nothing. And I couldn't remember, but during the debate, I knew that Dawkins once had had a room in the museum, he worked there. So I mentioned, I said, isn't it true that this building was dedicated to the glory of God? And oh no, oh no, but he was entirely wrong. The building was built with profits from Oxford University Press's sale of Bibles, if you please. <laughs> And it was dedicated to the glory of God. And it was such a pity because it fizzled when he denied it, I couldn't really assert it. So uh, retrospect is wonderful. Uh, do you think you were able to, what kind of personal rapport were you able to build, if at all, with Dawkins or- Zero. With Zero, yeah. Sadly, I, I did try, I believe I tried, but it was very difficult, but I had personal rapport with all the others. Mm -hmm. And just to show you what effect that can have, going back to Singer, at the beginning of the talk, I wondered how I'd start because I had some very vicious letters telling me to rip him to shreds because of his ethical stance, you see. You got to slit his throat kind of thing intellectually. And I wondered, how do I handle this? Because many people watching would be aware of his attitude to the unborn and his ideas of people having licenses to get rid of unwanted children, all this kind of thing. So I decided to start my lecture by saying that my I have very big difficulties with Peter Singer's ethical views, but we're not here to discuss his ethical views. I believe that many of his ethical views come straight from his atheism, and that's what we're here to discuss. But before we do that, I would like to strongly recommend one of his books, and he looked utterly astonished. and. I think the, the title of the book is something like The Life I Can Save. And there's some very powerful stuff in it for Christians to take heed of. So I mentioned this and I said, I would exhort here everybody to read that book, whether they're Christian, atheist or, or whatever, because there's some very important principles in it. When we'd finished, he came over to me and he shook my hand. He said, thank you so much. I said, for what? He said, I want to tell you, no Christian has ever treated me the way you treated me tonight. Oh. Oh. And he said, I want you to be the distinguished guest at a special private lecture I'm giving tomorrow night. It was very difficult, but I managed to arrange to go. And it's things like that, that, open people to respond. And I'm always looking for that, some dimension, some bridge to build, that's not just simply a bridge of intellect. And it was quite something for him to say that because I had made him look quite silly during the session mm -hmm. on occasions. So you do learn a lot from those kind of things. And you realize that everybody's a human being. And when it comes to these people who are very well known, it's very important to learn not to let people intimidate you. Before I did my first debate, I was, I had an interview, a conversation with a very famous British journalist, very well known, who knew Hitchens very well. And he said, John, I'm going to give you a bit of advice. I said, I'd like a bit of advice. He said, don't try to outwit him. I said, no, I won't. 
but he said decide before you start that whatever he says you will say communicate what you feel you have to communicate because the biggest danger for you going into this debate is you you will allow him to set the agenda and you will simply respond that was brilliant advice and i think it applies at all levels that i go into the debates and uh, it's illustrated by what dawkins said to me just before our first debate he said as we walked towards the stage he said you know i don't debate well, I said, if it's any comfort, I don't either. It's the first time I'd ever done anything like it. And I said, this evening, all I want to do is to put into the public space a credible alternative to your atheism and let the people decide. And he said, I'll buy that. And that's exactly what I tried to do. Let the people decide. Believe people are capable of responding to evidence and make sure you get your evidence across. Excellent, excellent. Let me uh, shift to another side of your life and ministry. Uh, you've spent a great deal of time teaching the Bible all over Central and Eastern Europe, uh, former Soviet Union. Um, along with your academic work. Now, to get back behind that, how did you maintain your own walk with God with all the pressures of academic work and then adding on top of that a rigorous travel schedule for, for decades? How did, how did you maintain that lively walk with God without settling into the doldrums? Well, there's a sense in which God maintained it, but that's a, that's a, that's a trite answer to it. I think the important thing was a very deep conviction that I had from very young that Christianity was true and it was intellectually respectable and could be defended. And I was active in that kind of defense, even as a schoolboy, although I knew very little about how to do it. And I continued that at Cambridge. The second thing was, I had a brilliant mentor who went to glory uh, a year or so ago, Professor David Gooding. And he opened my eyes to the treasure of scripture and he taught me how to teach scripture. And he made a point to me when I was very young he said, why do you study scripture? And he answered his own question in a way that has stayed with me. He said, you know, some people study the Bible to prepare sermons. Oh, I said, well, I mean, don't we all do that? He said, yes, but if that's all we're doing, it's very dangerous. And I said, why? He said, well, let me tell you why I read my bible prayerfully and study it it's to get to know god and he said if you spend your time in the bible simply preparing things for other people you're going to miss what it's all about i never forgot that because he's absolutely right we can easily when we're involved in bible teaching ministry other any other kind become a kind of quasi professional at it and we can study the word but it, it it doesn't impact us at all and he said you know if it doesn't impact you it'll impact nobody else and i remember him saying to me i can tell within two or three minutes listening to somebody speak whether they have any real spiritual authority whether the lord has spoken to them or not and that kind of thing weighed on me now of course I haven't been perfect or anything like that, but that very high standard that if I'm going to have something to say that has got real spiritual authority to it, then there's no shortcut to that. I've got to get to know God, not simply scripture, but got to get to know God prayerfully through my study of scripture. And he said to me, you know, long ago, he said, my 
preaching ministry came out of my study in scripture. I stopped studying scripture to prepare sermons. I just got into the word and the sermons came out of that. Now, that happened to me as well and made a huge difference. So that relationship with the word of God, allowing so far as I could, and I say imperfectly, because I'm a sinner like the rest of people, made a huge difference. The second thing that made a huge difference was having a wife that shared the journey of faith in God with me. And uh, Sally, my wife, never had the benefit of a higher education, which is sad, but she has been a wonderful mother and companion. And reading and praying together with her was very important. And I'm amazed often how many people I meet, academics, are not Christians, and they never pray or read with their wives, which is utterly astonishing to my mind. How, how can you really share? So there was a strength in the family and in friends who prayed. But looking back, I realized that there was a period of time, especially when I was a junior lecturer, where I did probably too much traveling. I was away from home a lot. And because I was a pure mathematician, I could do mathematics when I was abroad. And often I'd go to Hungary, for example, for a week, and I'd live with an elderly couple who didn't interrupt me. I'd do mathematics all day, and I then I'd expound scripture for three hours every night, and then I'd go home. And that was pretty hard work. And probably it was, it took too much out of me and it was too hard on the family. They never complained, I had phenomenal support, but nevertheless, looking back, I ought to have proportioned my time a little bit better than that. Although the blessing to people around the world was, I could see the effect it had, you see. so. All these things um, are important, but I would add something. I used to think that your question, that work-life balance, the maintenance of a vibrant faith in, in God in the midst of it all, was a problem to be solved. And once you'd solved that problem, you would start to live. <laughs> I remember again, David Gooding, he laughed. I said, what are you laughing at? He said, you've got it wrong. I said, how? He said, living is solving that problem. That is living. That is what life is about. And that change in perspective has been enormously important to me. Instead of looking at these things as problems to be solved and you get them out of the way and then you live, this is what living is. It's learning to balance these things up. It's learning to know just how much time you spend with your family and your job and, and so on. Now, as an academic, I knew from the beginning that I was reasonably good, but I wasn't anything like the superstars of mathematics. They are way light years ahead of me. And no matter how long I worked or studied, I could never be like them. I wanted to do a competent job of work, but I wouldn't sell my soul for it. So in a sense, most of my life, I had <coughs> two parallel careers. And I left her, I thought I was leaving academia at just in my early 50s, because my Christian ministry was so heavy, but then the Lord had other plans and turned me into an Oxford professor, which is incredible. After I'd effectively left academia, I went back in, but then I didn't have the responsibility of large classes or running a department and all this kind of thing. So I've had a very strange academic career. So I wouldn't uh, say that this is the norm or even could be the norm for any, anyone else. But I say that the basic Christian confession is Jesus is Lord. You don't have to persuade him to be. You simply have to accept that he is and follow as best you can. Okay. 
Now, I hope you uh, do not miss one of the key points of counsel that uh, John just gave us, and that is praying together for those of you who are married, praying with your spouse. And my wife and I were just talking about this a few days ago that, as I mentioned, we're, we read the Word to, together every night, and right now we're reading uh, John's book, Determined to Believe, but just to pray together as a couple. And often I find an imbalance in academic marriages, and uh, this, this maintains that first and foremost we're brother and sister in Christ, and we come before him each night. That's right. And if I might add to that, one thing I've noticed, if you don't mind me saying this among men, is the lack of consultation often. I will never accept an invitation unless I've thoroughly discussed it with my wife. Mm -hmm. And the difference that can make, and I have mentioned that to many younger people involved in Christian ministry, and they've come later and thanked me for it and said it's made a huge difference. That attitude, which many men unfortunately have, or some men, I shouldn't say many, uh, oh, she'll understand and she'll agree. Well, maybe she will, but to, call her in and <laughs> when I had um, some years back I was getting very busy and I had an assistant and my wife was always in at those meetings when we discussed the diary and therefore she knows and uh, she usually made no objection but sometimes she did she said I don't think you should do that and, and that's fine and that gives them confidence we really need to bring our spouses along with us and i'm old of course i'm 77 now and i suspect the modern generation is different but in my generation many of the especially older men just did what they wanted yeah. and uh, the attitude towards women was not exactly christian i'm afraid our our ministry effectiveness is no more credible than the authenticity of our marriage relationship. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask one more question, and then I want to open up for our group. Um, tell us about a time when you were discouraged or frustrated, and how did you deal with this? Well, again, genetic questions are difficult. What do I think of when I think of frustration? Uh, I think of book publishers that don't really market all the books properly that I put a lot of work into. I think of being invited to a foreign country and done a lot of work preparing. And I find that the local people have not invested the time in advertising it and so on. And very few people turn up. and. That kind of thing I find really frustrating because if people ask me to do work for them, I expect them to work uh, in, the, in the same way. And you can be let down by your fellow believers. Mm -hmm. And what do I do about it? Well, sometimes I have to actually exhort them and even rebuke them because it's the only way they're going to learn. Uh, there was one famous occasion, well, in my memory, where a hosting team absolutely insisted that I would take sequential questions with a microphone. Now, that is not my way of doing it for reasons you can ask me. I tend to collect a number of questions and answer them together. But they said, no, I was to do this. So I did it. And the very first question was a young man who stood up and he said this. He said, well, this morning when I woke up, I was thinking of asking you a question. But then you see, it's very difficult to think of a suitable question for a meeting like this. And then, of course, when you look at all the difficulties, he went on for 10 minutes oh. until I had to forcibly shut him up. It destroyed the whole Q&A. And I spoke to them all afterwards. I said, never you do that again. Do you realize you destroyed the entire evening? There were well over a thousand people there, mm. um, students. And uh, I will relate that story to avoid it yeah. because they just don't realize that there are sensible ways of dealing with that danger. And it's an increasing danger 
in monopolizing microphones. The Q&A, to my mind, is one of the most important times. So perhaps we'd better get into it. 